In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Without fail, on the first Sunday in Lent, we hear about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. And it's an appropriate way to begin our Sundays in Lent. Our 40-day fast is in some ways modeled on Jesus' time in the desert. And it's a reminder to us that as we face temptation, as we face perhaps difficulties with the disciplines we've decided to take on, that Christ faced temptation as well, that we don't face that struggle alone. Every three years, as we work our way through the lectionary, we get to hear Mark's version of this, which is so short that the folks who put the lectionary together needed to add a little bit of context on both sides, a little bit before and a little bit after, so that our gospel reading could be more than two sentences long. So because of that, every three years as we begin the season of Lent, we're presented with Jesus' baptism by John in the River Jordan. And it feels somewhat incongruous as we start this season of fasting and preparation. Temptation, that seems Lenten. Wilderness, Lenten. The Great Litany, definitely Lenten. And Jesus' call to repentance seems Lenten as well. But baptism? Baptism seems to be totally out of character for this season. But it's here nonetheless. And so on the first Sunday in Lent, we catch a glimpse of the brightness of Easter. The wider lens afforded us by Mark's shortness allows us to see Christ's temptation in the wilderness in the context of his baptism and his preaching, and that's helpful. This larger context reminds us that none of this happened for its own sake, that the temptation in the wilderness only makes sense when it's paired with Jesus' baptism that preceded it and with his message of hope, good news, and repentance that follows it. That need for context, that wider lens, applies to this whole season of Lent as well and the work that we're called to do in it. The traditional practices of fasting, giving alms, praying, taking stock of our lives, these are not practices that exist for their own sake. They are encouraged so that we who have already found new life in Christ can bring to the center of our attention that which is already at the very center of our lives. They're there to remind us of our fundamental identity as people who have already come up out of the waters of baptism, come up out of the waters of baptism with Jesus, people who have heard, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. You are my daughter, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. You are my child, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. That is the message that sits behind and supports our Lenten work. Indeed, it is the foundation of all that we do as Christians because it is that love that led God in Christ to the cross. And it's with that in mind that we should hear the preaching that Jesus begins at the end of our gospel. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The order of all of this is important. The kingdom of God has already come near in Christ. God has already sought us out. God has already loved us. God has already become one of us, been baptized, though he had no sin in solidarity with those who need to repent and been tempted as we are. And having done all of that, having gotten down into the muck and mud of the world, it is then that God calls us to repent. 
That repentance is the consequence of God's redeeming work and not the cause. Our response to God's love for us is to turn away from those things that lead us only to death. To make that so often difficult decision to turn away from those practices, those attitudes, those things that draw us away from the love of God, and instead to turn towards the abundant life that is offered in Christ Jesus. It is especially fitting this year that we're seeing the wider view of Christ's time in the wilderness. The entry into Lent this year has seemed harder than usual, I think, for many of us. There is a sense in which the entirety of the last year has been an extended and involuntary Lent. But one of the gifts of our liturgical calendar is that it inexorably and unwaveringly moves us forward through our celebrations that may have been subdued. We have celebrated together Easter, Pentecost, Advent, and Christmas. Though they were changed, they came indeed. And having done all of that, we have returned, as we do each year, to this great season of fasting and penitence. This yearly rhythm provides stability for us when there is little certainty, and it propels us forward when all else seems stagnant. Alexander Schmemann, an Orthodox liturgical theologian, spoke of Lent as a season defined by bright sadness. In an introduction to the theology of the season, he reminds his readers that each year Lent and Easter are once again the rediscovery and recovery by us of what we were made through our own baptismal death and resurrection. Yet as we begin to make the first step into the bright sadness of Lent, we see far, far away the destination. It is the joy of Easter, it is the entrance into the glory of the kingdom, and it is this vision, the foretaste of Easter, that makes Lent's sadness bright and our Lenten effort a spiritual spring. The night may be dark and long, but all along the way a mysterious and radiant dawn seems to shine on the horizon. My friends, earlier this week in the Ash Wednesday liturgy, we were invited to the observance of a holy Lent. This morning's readings cast that invitation in a slightly different light. They are a reminder to us that we are called to engage the disciplines and season in the full light of our baptism and with trust in the promises of Easter Day so that we can continually hear Christ's call for repentance for what it truly is, a call to turn our backs on the way of sin and death so that each of us might embrace with joy the glory of the abundant life that has already been prepared for us.